I guess the, the first challenge is to decide what is it and when does it start. And for a lot of people, I think you probably have your own definition, and that's just as valid as, as mine. I'm saying that it's when we started representing information using discrete levels, a binary system of, of 1 and 0, and when we could do that using electronic means. So I'm starting the digital age with essentially the development of the digital computer. So that's where I'm positioning the digital age. Uh, and you may choose to position it slightly differently, but uh, that's where I start. And some of this has already been said. Um, the post office, uh, their research establishments in North London, Dollis Hill, underdid a lot of the pioneering work in electronic switching, um, with Tommy Flowers leading that group. The building still exists, except it's now converted to relatively exclusive flats. <laughs> so it, it no longer um, has any research contribution. The other area, of course, which is very important in the development of the computer is Bletchley Park uh, near Milton Keynes, which does remain open to the public now as a museum and is also the home of the National Museum of Computing, which is an evolving museum. And if you've not been to either, I recommend you go to both on a regular basis because it changes as well. So uh, I can recommend a trip to um, Bletchley Park. Of course, it was Alan Turing's uh, work on developing the concepts of what led to the digital computer at Bletchley Park that is so relevant here. It was, though, in Manchester, the University of Manchester, where these all, all of these ideas start coming together to create what is the world's first stored program computer. We've already heard that Colossus and other computer developments at Bletchley Park had a programmability capability, but this was a stored program uh, capability. And um, with Tom Kilburn and um, Freddie Williams, they developed what is known as the baby. And although the baby itself doesn't exist, uh, a full-scale replica does and operates, I think, on every Tuesday at the museum, Tuesday and Thursday at the Museum of Science and Industry at the Revolution Manchester Gallery. So you can go and actually see this thing still working, or at least a, a replica of it still working. So what we start to do is to develop the digital programmable computer. And it's that which I say defines the commencement of the digital age. Ferranti, again, based in Manchester, took those ideas of the baby and commercialized it into the world's first commercial uh, programmable computer, the Ferranti Mark I, which was developed in its West Gorton factories uh, in August 1950. And the first model, I believe, was commissioned at the University of Manchester. The photograph here shows that on the 9th of July 1951. The West Gorton factory, as it existed at the bottom right there, was replaced with a more modern building, a tower block construction, uh, which was then transferred to ICL um, and then Fujitsu, but I think is actually not used by either now. Um, so the, the original building of Ferranti uh, has gone, but the site uh, was transformed into ICL and, and then Fujitsu. Once you've got digital processing electronically, then people start to look at how we can apply that technology and particularly how we apply it into the telephone network. Much earlier than the development of the computer, Alec Reeves came up with the concept of pulse code modulation in fact, back in 1938. What pulse code modulation does is it takes the analog human voice, it samples it at a regular interval, and for each sample is converted to a number which is then represented by a binary digits. Those binary digits of ones and zeros are then transmitted instead of the analog voice. So you convert your voice to a sequence of numbers, and it's those numbers which are transmitted, not the analog representation. Although he came up with the ideas of that in 1938, the technology of the day wasn't up to standard to allow it to be implemented in practical terms. And it wasn't, in fact, until 1956 that the British Post Office began trials of pulse code modulation, or PCM, for voice transmission. Those trials were not actually that successful. 
And that actually led, at the time, the major switching capabilities and technologies of the telephone network were still based on Strouger electromechanical switching. They were considering a move to a more advanced <coughs> electromechanical switching called crossbar. And actually, the failure of those early PCM trials caused the adoption of crossbar technology. The GPO were trying to jump to digital quite early. Uh, those trials were not successful in their terms, and so that led to the adoption of the next generation of electromechanical switching, which was crossbar. What happens when you transmit something digitally is that you can overcome some of the noise problems. So long as you know each digit is definitely a 1 or definitely a 0, it doesn't matter that the voltage has changed, so long as you still can recognize a 1 from a 0. Then you can convert it back to a number, and therefore you have something which is more resistance to electrical noise. Despite that early setback, pulse code modulation was developed and implemented on the 27th of November between the Sunbury on Thames Exchange and Faraday Exchange in London. That was a PCM trunk route so that the, the telephone calls transmitted between those two exchanges were digitized and sent across. The first digital exchange John has already talked about, and that's the Empress Exchange, uh, which was um, opened on the 11th of September 1968, and the Science Museum preserved a complete rack um, of the Empress Exchange. I can't equal that, but I do have a card from Empress. So this is actually one of the switching cards um, from the Empress Exchange, which has been kindly uh, sourced for us by BT Heritage. So it's quite a nice little <coughs> artifact there, and you can come and have a look at that uh, afterwards if you're interested. What was also developing then was the computer itself. So we're looking at computer type technology being used in the telephone network, but we're also looking at the evolution of the computer as a computer, and people wanting to access that computer remotely using terminals. And to do that, the telephone network provided that means of connection. So we have the computer terminal, the remote access terminal on the left, wanting to communicate with the central mainframe computer on the right over a telephone line. And the way that those two systems were integrated was the development of the modulator or demodulator, or as we call it, the modem. And the early modem produced for the GPO, the Daytel modem number 1A, shown here at the bottom left, actually could transmit digital information from a remote access terminal to the mainframe computer at the staggering rate of 200 bits per second which is a little slower than what we're used to today, but was lightning speed uh, at that time. Um, in March 1969, GPO report said that there were 3,334, uh, quite a precise number, uh, modems in use on their network. And they recognized that there was an importance of providing computer communications on the telephone network, but they assessed the forecast growth in this and had identified that really transmission speeds of 10,000 bits per second were probably as great as it needed to grow. So the GPO had a plan for developing their network to support computer communications, but clearly had identified that it was going to have what we would see now as quite restricted um, development. But the telephone network isn't necessarily best suited to communications of computers. The, the way this is done, the modem replicates the telephone. So essentially, the remote access terminal dials the mainframe computer. The mainframe computer answers it, just as someone would answer your phone call. A connection is established and remains open throughout the use of that line. Even if no data is passing from the remote access terminal to the computer or back the other way, that phone circuit is in use and open, just as it would be for a voice call. And when you're finished, you terminate the call. Now, computer communications doesn't actually necessarily fit that model. And some of the pioneering work was done at the National Physical Laboratories by Donald Davis. And he said, with computer communications, it's different. 
With a computer communications, it sends pieces of information and has a response. And then there may be a pause. And then more information sent. It isn't a continuous transmission. And he came up with his team with the concept of packet switching. Now let me try to give you an illustration of what the difference is. Imagine we had a book. I could take that book, parcel it up, and send it as an entire package, a single package. That would effectively be like the telephone call. I wrap it up, I send it, the whole thing goes at once. With packet switching, what we would do is essentially take each page and send each page separately. Now, when I'm sending the entire book, if it's a large book, the whole book has to be sent. And whilst that's being sent, nothing else can be transmitted at the same time. If I'm transmitting at a page at a time, then when I send my page, somebody else could send another page and someone else could send a page of their book. We can multiplex or intersperse these digital communications one behind the other. Not only that, if there was an error, I'm only going to lose a page of the book, not the whole book, and so only the page that's damaged would have to be retransmitted. And so this is packet switching in the sense of data, information is parceled up into small sections, each section is sent on its own, and then the next piece is sent, and then the next piece, and then the next, and the far end reassembles them all back into the whole. The world's first local area packet switching network was created at the NPL. Uh, it's called the Data Communications Network and was opened in 1971. Um, I know that the NPL have a small museum. I've never actually visited it, and I think they have preserved one or two boards and components from those early days, but um, that's, I'm not 100% certain that is the case. They certainly have the information recorded and photographically recorded on their website. Over in America, the Advanced Research Project Agency, which was a government-funded um, funding body essentially to support research in government establishments and universities, was looking at how they too could connect together computers that were funded through ARPANET projects. And they came up with this concept called the ARPANET. And they were looking at how they could indeed connect these computers together. Yes, it would be telephone lines, but what sort of communication system would they use? And in parallel, completely independently of uh, Donald Davis's work, Paul Barron of the Rand Corporation had also been looking at something which was called packet switching. And the, 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 the work of Donald Davis and the war, work of Paul Barron led to ARPANET adopting packet switching as the means of communication between computers over these telephone lines. To do that, they would have to create proper dedicated communication processes, which were known as IMPs or information message processes, and they sat between the computer and the network. In today's parlance, we would have called that a router. The first four computers were connected to the ARPANET using three information message processes, which are the circles, um, the three main circles there, and you've got an offshoot to the top right, and the four rectangles are the four computers that were connected. That was in December 1969. That was the sketch produced uh, of that network. Unfortunately, that sketch was preserved because that is the birth of the internet. Today's internet has a direct lineage back to that diagram. So the internet began life in December 1969 with those four computers being connected to the fledgling ARPANET using packet switching as its technology. Whilst the General Post Office had looked at developing computer communications and recognized the value of the modem, they were not initially going to consider packet switching. They were going to look at how they could continue to develop traditional telephone type communications. But they were then persuaded with the developments at NPL to look at developing a, pulse, um, a, a packet switching network. In 1977, they launched 
the first publicly accessible packet switching network, which was called Electronic uh, Experimental Packet Switch Stream, or EPSS. That had exchanges in London, Manchester, and Glasgow. Uh, I'm desperately trying to find out what exchange in Manchester was used. Um, anybody who knows, please, I'd like to know afterwards. Obviously, there are lots of exchanges in Manchester. All of the literature tells me everything I want to know about how it works, but not which exchange it was. I do have an open question to be answered in BT Heritage at the moment, uh, and they've they are looking through the archives, but all the references just say London, Manchester, Glasgow. They don't go precisely down to the exchange. The development of packet switching in the telephone industry was then taken forward through what was known as the CCITT standards body, and they came up with a standard called X25. So the telecommunications companies, very much coming from the telephony background, developed packet switching into a standard which became known as X25. And although it's packet switching, it's a different variety of packet switching to that which is being developed in the ARPANET and computer communications in general. And what you find are these two worlds emerging. There's the computer world, people who have developed the computer and then get into communications, go into a particular variety of packet switching. Whereas the telecommunications companies that have come from a telephony world and adopted packet switching as a telephony service on their networks adopt an X25 variety of packet switching. Don't have time to go into the two subtleties of what these, the differences are at a technical level, but they are effectively two strands of the same concept of packet switching. The GPO opened their first X25 standards-based packet switching network on the 20th of August 1981, uh, and that was called Packet Switch Stream, or PSS. The photograph there is the group responsible for developing the X25 standard on the day that it was ratified by CCITT. In 2006, the last of the packet switch stream exchanges was actually turned off. So PSS has been and gone. This is a theme that's recurred all day, hasn't it? The technology emerges, does its job, disappears, and we never hear of it again. So PSS, packet switch stream, came and went by 2006. And what it's been replaced by, of course, is the internet. Because of the two worlds, the internet world that came out of ARPANET and the X25 world that came out of the telco, it's actually the computer world of doing things and their breed of packet switching, which we call TCP IP, that is now the dominant one. UK got its first internet connection thanks to the work of Professor Peter Kirstein at University College London. He actually managed to get the installation in UCL of a terminal information processor as part of the ARPANET network. Now it was connected to the American ARPANET network by a bit of a tortuous route. There was a satellite link from America to Norway because there was a seismic research establishment in Norway that had already been connected to ARPANET. There was then an undersea route through the, the existing BT network or GPO network at the time used for connecting from Oslo to uh, UCL in London. That whole combination led to a connection from UCL to America at 9.6 thousand bits a second. At UCL, that terminal information processor was connected to a DEC PDP-9 computer, and from there it was linked out to the Rutherford Appleton laboratories. Through contact at the Museum of London, Professor Peter Kirstein has been approached to ask how much of that equipment still exists. Sadly, the answer is none. So evidence of the UK's first ever connection to the internet has also now been lost. But it was then, in 1973, that the UK became connected to what we now understand as the internet. Computer communications, digitalization, 
is now applied through the telephone network for the delivery of speech. We've already heard about pulse code modulation and we've looked at the development of X25 for communication between computers. The development of the digital telephone network for the transmission of voice in digital form actually started with the advisory group on systems definition which was a partnership between the post office and key manufacturers. And they were set up in 1968 to look at how the future of the voice telephony network should evolve. And System X, as it became known, came out of a collaboration with particularly GEC, Plessy and the Standard Telephone Company. Um, it was premiered at the Geneva Telecom 79 exhibition, the picture at the top right, is the display stand uh, of the System X system. Now, we've had a chat over lunch and there's a de debate now as to whether this next date is correct. Um, I had it down as the 1st of July 1980 that the first System X exchange um, was actually opened in Baynard House in London. Um, my, our colleague who's here today from Openreach thinks it was a little later than that, so we might have to just research that date a little more. But certainly by 1988, the whole of the UK trunk network had gone digital, and I think that was the first of the national carriers in the world to fully go digital. And by 1998, all of the UK telephone network was digital. And what this meant it was that as soon as you made a phone call from 1998, when you've been making phone calls, your voice, apart from that piece of wire between you and the telephone exchange, your local exchange, from that point forward has been sent as digital ones and zeros, not as the analog voice itself. So the digital network has been operational for voice uh, fully across the UK from 1998. And I thought it was useful at this point to talk a little bit about that other side of archaeology, the manufacturers who made all this equipment. And the one I've chosen is Edge Lane, Liverpool. Um, now, if you've ever driven along Edge Lane, driving into Liverpool, you've got plenty of time to look around. That's uh, my experience of Edge Lane, anyway. Um, and on the left, as you drive into uh, Liverpool along Edge Lane, you would have seen, hence the, take, hence the word would, um, have seen this factory. It started out in 1903 as the automatic uh, telephone manufacturing company. It went on to make the Strouger equipment that was used in the UK's first Strouger exchange in Epson. No, that was American. American? Yeah. Was it now? Actually, Atemco was 1911, not 1903. Ah. And the first equipments for the first few exchanges in Britain were imported. Right. The American So they were the first ones to make it and after that then? Edge Lane started manufacturing its own about 1915-16. Right, so that's, they didn't make it for the first one, no. but they, start, they were the first ones to start making it afterwards then. Correct. Right, okay. So <laughs> just as well sorry, John's here. Sorry to break it. No, 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 <laughs> please. No, no, we need to get this right. So they were the first to start, they were the first in the UK to make, make Strouger equipment. That's the correct fact. Right, okay. Um, they also went on, I mentioned earlier about the pulse code modulation trials not being as successful as the GPO had wanted and that led to the adoption of crossbar. This factory made those crossbar exchanges. At its height, according to their, the website, at 1963 it employed 14,000 people. It became Plessy Telecommunications and the first System X exchanges were made there as well. And you've got the um, container, which has been hoisted in the central photograph there, is a System X container uh, with System X exchanges in. It then evolved into GEC Plessy Telecommunications, then Marconi, and now it's closed <coughs> and gone. So this huge site that employed 14,000 people has been at the forefront of the development of telecommunications technology in the UK, disappeared. No sign of it left. And yet all of the technology that made the advancements possible, <laughs> an awful lot of them, came out of that factory. This picture, th this clip from the um, BT Today, um, April 1986, celebrates Manchester's first System X exchange. 
This is the Deansgate Exchange, which it does acknowledge is technically in Salford, because it says here that the mayor of Salford actually unveiled a plaque um, to, to commemorate this occasion. And it was, according to this, the um, largest G uh, system X exchange opened at that time because of the highest concentration of business customers in that particular area. And what they did, Stuart Hall, uh, we'll recognise the TV personality, talking to someone you might not recognise on the television, but it's Joanna Lumley, uh, was in London, and he phoned her using System X, and it was obviously, she was on a video link, so you could see how quickly she responded. And then Pat O'Keefe from BT Manchester made the similar call, but using the old analogue system, and you could see the difference. And it says that System X was about 12 seconds quicker at setting up the call. So you've got, better, you've got quicker call rates, but also the handsets. Um, that uh, Viscount telephone there has two additional keys on, apart from the normal 0 to 9, and that's the star and the hash key. And you start getting these extra functionality uh, built into the, the telephone system. It still makes phone calls. It, it still connects you in the way that all the previous technologies did. All of these advancements are buried in the network. You don't really see them. You, you, you actually get some effect in the sense that the call is made quicker, the connection is quicker, but apart from that, it, it's still, as far as you're concerned, a telephone. What it does give is the telecoms company a lot easier to maintain infrastructure and obviously a lot less staff intensive. So needless to say, they didn't need to have resident engineers at every telephone exchange. Um, and um, you don't need as big a telephone exchange because the equipment is that much smaller. So you downsize the staff and you can also downsize some of the buildings. In parallel to all of that, of course, something else is happening to the computer. It's finding its way into our homes. And it's finding our way into, it, into our homes through the development of the home computer with some classics like Sinclair ZX81, the Dragon 32, the BBC Micro, the Commodore 64, all different, of course, all proprietary to the company who made them, all slightly different in functionality, but they're starting to appear. There's this home computer revolution taking place. And what happens then is that all these different models, all incompatible, are unified essentially by the launch of the IBM PC. What the IBM PC does, it's not when it's launched in the reach of the average person at home, it's far too expensive, but what it does do is standardise the definition of what is a home computer, what is a personal computer. And from that, you start seeing the PC clone and cheaper versions of it, which do then appear in the home. And of course, it is the development of standard software like Microsoft Windows that makes that adoption even greater. And an awful lot of people took the PC into their home because of children and school and education. So what starts with these vintage machines from all these different manufacturers then get unified through the IBM PC and its subsequent clones and the launch of important software such as Microsoft Windows. Those computers are then connected over the telephone lines to other computers around the country with modems. But because of the development of the digital telephone exchange, System X, that connection speed on that modem can now be a lot faster than it used to be. And this is the one that people dreamed of, really. If you had one of these, you were at the cutting edge of modem technology. It's a V90 modem. It operates at 56,000 kilobits per second one way and 33,000 the other. This was the culmination in modem technology for PCs connected over the telephone network, connected to the digital telephone network. So modem technology had pushed us to the limits uh, of the V90 modem. But inevitably, people had a thirst for more information. But where's this information coming from? Well, 
the early development of information systems can be illustrated in many ways, and I've chosen to illustrate it through the view data system, um, represented here by the BT Prestel system. What this was, central computer, it was actually called uh, an information retrieval centre, but it was a computer, and on there was stored information called pages. Any of this sound familiar? <laughs> and those pages were provided by providers. And what did those pages include? Well, British Rail timetables, price lists from Comet, um, Bank of Scotland down the bottom left, and there was even a messaging system, uh, an early form of, uh, a fairly crude form of email, and you've got Valentine's messages being exchanged at the top right, and you can check your stocks and shares as well. <coughs> Pages of information, you connected your home computer, you dialed up the Prestel computer, and you could then display these pages on your computer screen, and you could select a different page number, and you'd move on. It was based on the same character set as Teletext, but of course this was an interactive two-way system, as opposed to Teletext being a broadcast receive only system. <coughs> the first IRC for Prestel was opened uh, in um, St Alfred House in Fourth Street in London, and by June 1980, Prestel had expanded um, to include um, central computers in Birmingham, Edinburgh, Manchester, and it could handle 15,000 simultaneous connections into the Prestel system an early form of information system that people were using their modems to connect. But this, of course, was the one that was developed that changed the world. Tim Berners-Lee, or Sir Tim Berners-Lee, working at CERN, actually brought together lots of different concepts, the packet switching of the internet with hypertext way of representing information. And he, in 1989, March, produced a paper that said information management a proposal that was actually the invention of the World Wide Web, with its web pages, which in simple terms looked just like Prestel pages. The graphics were a bit different. This is um, claims to be the first website ever produced by Tim Berners-Lee, and I think you can recognize his typing uh, as his own, um, <laughs> unlike the handwriting, because how do we know it's the first one? Um, how do we know? what websites used to look like. <laughs> Who stores the web pages? All that digital content. Where is? You, I'm, I'm sure we can go into museums and libraries and find early manuscripts and you can say that was the first of its type and it still exists. Where's the first website? Who's got it? No one. There are some websites this being one, um, it's called the, the, the Internet Time Machine. That's the URL. And they have captured lots of different websites. Um, and you can go back and find your organization, and it will show you what it looked like many years ago. But again, it's not totally correct. It's not fully stored. So we're, the digital content has long gone. Speeding up the network, um, Sir so Charles Ko. Uh, working at standard telephones, developed fiber optics. That's the factory that he joined. The, below it is the photograph now of the derelict site. So the development of fiber optics in 1965 and the adoption into the telephone network, the birthplace of that is rapidly on its route to demolition. Transatlantic fibers, uh, the first transatlantic telephone cable that was fiber was laid in 1988 by the AT&T cable ship Long Lines, now scrapped, gone, um, and uh, it could carry 40,000 simultaneous telephone calls. The most recent fiber optic cable can carry 10 million simultaneous phone calls across the Atlantic, and that map at the bottom, the red lines, are where the fiber cables run today that power the digital age. So our world is woven by fiber optic cables at the bottom of the ocean. The growth of the internet spurred on a desire for even more information. The V90 modem that people dreamed of owning just could not cope with what people now wanted to do. And so the telephone network into your house had to go through a new transformation. 
And that came about through the development of what's called digital subscriber line technology. But here in Manchester, something else happened. That the government announced cable television franchises and 9X got the local one to produce a, a brand new fibre coax network. Digital subscriber line works on traditional copper, the traditional copper pair cable. This is to get more data down there than your V90 modem could achieve. Um, June 2000, BT launches its first DSL services, and on, by a year later, a thousand exchanges are enabled. And what you're now seeing, and John already hinted at this this morning, is the fiber now getting close to your house. It's not gone into your house yet, but in order to speed this up even more, we need to replace more and more of the copper between you and the exchange with fibre. And that is what's known as fibre to the cabinet technology, and that's what's rolling out across the country right now. The, this is a, a picture of an archaeological dig that we're doing uh, out, outside of the uh, building in which I work. And as you go through the layers, you can see the green plastic cables, the green pipes, those green pipes carry the fibre optic cables on the University of Salford net campus which actually power our campus network and, and give us all of the usual access to the internet and so forth. The telecoms cables are buried underground in plastic conduit. If it's modern conduit, it's coloured green. So it's hidden from view. But just as John did this morning, it does appear above the surface every so often. That's a standard primary connection point on the right is its new replacement that goes alongside it for superfast broadband. This is where the fibre comes in and interfaces to the remainder of the copper into your house. These things are slightly bigger and they're living organisms because if you listen to them, they're humming because there's actually electronics in there and you can hear the, the, the different cooling fans and so forth whirring. That is to give you more and more digital bandwidth into your home. And I've also taken some pictures of some uh, <laughs> duct <laughs> plates, <laughs> uh, as you do. They always say in archaeology, you should look up. Well, you should also look down. <laughs> These two here, this pair, actually have 9x written on them. Now, who knows what 9x means these days? It's probably forgotten, yet it's very recent history. Late 1990s. So 9x still exists on its plates and that one to the right is a standard BT one. The two-digit number, I understand, is the year, I think. <laughs> the mobile phone, John's already talked about the mobile phone, but I want to talk about the digital mobile phone. That is the first Motorola digital mobile phone. That is the first Nokia digital mobile phone. Obviously, mobile phones existed before they went digital, but um, Chris Gent, Managing Director of Vodafone, said the standard for GSM was the most important document written in the history of the mobile phone. It is the document that put Europe on a course to have a single digital mobile phone system. What you have to remember with first generation mobile is it stopped when you got to the English Channel because it was incompatible with the other systems in France, Germany, Holland and so on. The analog systems were country specific in many cases. GSM was written by the European Union to unify mobile phone systems across the whole of the European Union. It wasn't initially intending to adopt digital. It didn't say it had to, but the discussions and the evolution said it did. So these are examples of the first mobile phones that are digital technology. And of course, the telegraphy poles that one is photographed at a lovely uh, museum in Winchcombe uh, in the Cotswolds, the so Winchcombe Railway Museum, uh, and of course we are replacing them with our modern equivalent uh, mobile phone masts. So the visible sign of the mobile phone is the mast and the handset. And what you're starting to see with the mobile phone, of course, is that it would start evolving from a large phone. Well, when you open it, it's actually a pocket computer. Um, the first phones to then adopt an internet browser capability. Um, the first phone which allowed you to do something very important in telecommunications, 
change the colour of the cover. Um, the voice quality was so much better when you could do that. Um, the, the first phone that would have MIDI multi-tone ringtones, essential for modern day communications. So the mobile phone is the thing that people remember, but how many of those are preserved? You talk to people and they say, oh, I had one of those, and I had one of those, and I had one of those. The mobile phone was launched in the UK in 1985. It went digital in 1992. You're talking about a very young technology, and yet an awful lot of it nobody keeps anymore. And the evolution of the handset, uh, from a historical point of view, is rapidly being lost because the motivation of the mobile phone industry, once everybody's got a mobile phone, you're out of business. So you've got to evolve the handset for people to want another one. So you've got to have changeable covers because that introduces a whole new industry making covers and people say, mine can't change the cover, I'd better buy one that can. <laughs> Throw the old one away. The ringtones, which are MIDI, people say, oh, mine hasn't got that. I want to download the new tune. I'd better upgrade to a phone that has that capability. And on it goes. You advance the handset. People are totally obsessed with what's next, not what they currently have. As soon as they have it, it's pretty well out of date. When you have a technology like that, it's rapidly being eroded. And of course, the, the, the game changer in the mobile phone industry was the Apple iPhone, which came in in 2007. It redefined the mobile. Apple were not in the mobile phone industry. They came from nowhere with that product, and they blew Nokia and all the others out of the water. Nokia are still to kind of catch up, quite frankly, with what happened there. And they were the biggest manufacturer by far. They still are, but their market margin is reducing. But people are now talking about the iPhone 4 4GS. Who's talking about the iPhone 1? <laughs> Who's got an iPhone 1? Because if you've got it, preserve it, because others won't. This technology, this modern technology, is rapidly being lost because it's so rapidly changing. Here are some 21st century cathedrals of the digital age. Um, these build, how, I wonder how many of these buildings will survive. One of them here has been doing what it does today for well over 100 years. Top left, the internet in the UK relies on two big concentration points nationally. They're called internet exchange points. One's in London, one's in Manchester. That's the Manchester one. That building essentially holds the UK's second most important internet connection point that provides all of the internet access to everybody in the country. And there it is. Um, would you know that if you walked past it? It's an absolutely essential hub of the internet for people living in the UK. So where is that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's on the University of Manchester Science Park. It's not the only building. It is distributed in case a building is lost. Um, but it also has in there, you may have heard of cloud computing services. There's a massive data center in there used for cloud computing. Media City Salford on the right, where we are now, is the latest development for digital media production and broadcasting. In the building next door to us, we've got BBC Future Media Research. They are doing incredible things with mobile phones and televisions in readiness for the Olympics. That is happening next door. They are developing new uses of digital media to keep us entertained. For the Olympics, you will be able to essentially follow any athlete 24 hours of the day. You might not want to, but the digital <laughs> content will let you do it. Bottom left, pretty unimpressive factory, isn't it? That is a center of fiber optic manufacture, and I believe it's Europe's largest. It's in Blakely, Manchester. It started life in 1895 as Connolly's. Uh, for anybody who lives on North Manchester, it's probably a mile and a half from Manchester, uh, North Manchester Hospital. Um, in, in obscure site, center for fiber optic production 
and cable manufacture, now called B3 cables. So all of those cables that are going in the ground coming from factories like uh, B3 cable solutions. And <coughs> Slough, bottom right, um, UK headquarters of Research in Motion. Well, who the heck are they? Uh, were they Blackberry? So everybody behind Blackberry, that's where they're based. Well, the Blackberry is an absolutely iconic mobile phone. Would you have driven, would you have stopped as you went past that, that building? Um, these are the sort of buildings that represent the digital age. Pauline talked about some of the newspaper buildings that had some architectural importance and um, prominence and so forth. Would you say that of any of these? Yet they are critical parts, each one in its own way, of the digital age. And just as the Edge Lane factory in Liverpool, which was so important in developing the technology underpinning digital developments, that's gone, and the footprint of the digital age could soon disappear. The digital age is driven by a thirst for tomorrow's device and the next advancement. People will have thrown away their V90 modems and upgraded to v, um, ADSL routers and, and so forth. Yet that was an important point in the evolution of our technology. Eric Smick, uh, executive chairman of Google, last year said smartphone users upload more video footage to the web each month than all three big US television networks have broadcast in the last 60 years. <laughs> because a mobile phone wouldn't be a mobile phone if it didn't have a camera, and so people now are carrying recording devices and they're using the digital age to upload content. Well, how long does that content survive? Do we need to preserve it? Is it worthy of study? Uh, Ofcom have shown that over a quarter of adults and almost half of young people aged between 12 and 15 now own a smartphone. Of those, 37% of adults and 60% of teenagers admitted to being addicted to their technology. Digital age, this technology is part of everybody's life. But the pace of evolution is accelerating so fast, it's outstripping our ability to preserve it. How do you know which are the most important mobile phones to preserve? How do you know which is the most important digital content to preserve? Much of the digital content, particularly the software, anybody got the backup tapes for some of the early um, programmable telephone exchanges? Anybody got the software still from the ZX81? You know, where is that uh, good? Yes, some people have. Um, where is that software? That is being lost as well. An awful lot of the digital world and the digital age is actually intangible software, which is even harder to preserve than the more tangible paper and artifacts. So an awful lot of what we've said today is definitely true. It's getting worse in the digital age. It's eroding and rapidly disappearing. Um, I'll finish with an advert. If you want to do something next weekend, come along to the Museum of Science and Industry. We're running a public exhibition where we will be showcasing an awful lot of telecommunications equipment, including a whole range of working vintage computers. Home computers, that is. Thank you. <laughs>